Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2017 film Tragedy Girls, and when I'm doing this review, it's available for streaming on Hulu. Uh, this is, I'm doing for uh, a subscriber, Christina Arntz. She's really cool, uh, been really, really supportive of my channel, so thank you, Christina. And I would recommend that people check out her channel because she has some really cool videos. She's very open, and I've been enjoying watching her videos because it's kind of inspiring to me to kind of try to put myself out there more because she talks a lot about kind of doing things that take her out of her comfort zone. And um, she just seems very driven and to overcome like things like social anxiety and stuff like that. And um, I, I just find it inspiring, and I think she's a cool person. So check out her channel. It's Christina spelled with a K and then her last name, Arntz, A-R-N-T-Z. So check that out. And hopefully she likes this review. So this is directed by Tyler McIntyre, who also did Patchwork, which Patchwork is available for streaming on the Shutter streaming service right now. So after seeing this, I um, I think I'm going to check that out. I'm, I might do a review on that one too. Uh, then writing credits are for McIntyre himself, Chris Lee Hill, who also uh, wrote the screenplay Patchwork and a, one called Blowing Up right now. I don't know. And then Justin Olson, who wrote one called Dweller. Now, the big names in this, the, the people who did the best and are, you know, the main characters in it are played by Brianna Hildebrand, who you would know from Deadpool, Deadpool 2, and maybe The Exorcist TV show, which I have not watched. And Alexandra Shipp, who is in Straight Outta Compton, X-Men Apocalypse, X-Men Dark Phoenix. And both of them, I think, did a really good job in this film. They did a great job with the characters. They're interesting characters, well-written characters, and I think they just kind of, like, added extra to it. Uh, I think it's funny that both those actresses were X-Men, in essence, uh, in the in other films that they were in. They weren't in, the, in films together prior to this, but they both played X-Men, which I just find kind of funny. But um, the film actually played at South by Southwest, and then after screening there, was picked up for distribution. So, obviously... It was worth being picked up. Uh, the opening setup with the girls setting a trap to catch a killer in this one is a really interesting concept. I didn't really know where it was going to go at first because uh, the woman, what's her name, Sadie. Okay, the character of Sadie when she's making out with the guy in the car. Oh, by the way, uh, sorry, I forgot to say this. I am doing spoilers for this. So if you haven't seen the film yet, stop, go watch it, then come back because spoilers. Okay, and, and here we go. So when Sadie's making out in the car with the guy, I was kind of like, okay, you know, this is like a typical slasher. You know, they're making out. They're going to, you know, someone's getting killed or both of them are getting killed. And then it was immediately apparent that something's different when she started, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> got a lot of coughing going on. <laughs> Still stuff hanging out from being sick. But anyway. It became apparent that something's different when she starts acting kind of mean towards the guy she was making out with, and then you kind of get it once she makes him get out of the car after berating him, and then he gets killed, and then she and Michaela, who comes out of nowhere, uh, tase the, um, what do they call him, Rosedale Ripper, and capture him and, you know, decide, hey, can you be our mentor? Although, he refuses, obviously. <coughs> Sorry. I might have to drink some water here and there for this. It's been tough. So the opening setup with the girls... Um, oh no, sorry, I already said that. Sorry, it threw me off guard. Uh, this concept is interesting and it works mainly because the girls seem to be very upbeat and kind of like your, your kind of typical prissy girls. I mean, they're very much involved in like prom committee and they're kind of popular. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they're kind of popular, good looking all that jazz, so um, I think it works well as a horror comedy for that reason, because it's not taking itself seriously, and who they are at, at their core as characters is very, very helpful for the comedic aspect of it, and, you know, having the audience buy into that. They walk a super fine line of distancing themselves from the disappearances or the deaths of the people, but also at the same time trying to create tons and tons of hype for their website, Tragedy Girls, to, you know, get a better online presence, which the at the heart of this film, it's a lot about social media and the uses of social media and how ridiculous it is. But it's also very much about, like, generational gap between, um, I put down at one point, and I'll talk about it, it's more like millennial versus boomer situation. So, and I know those are both pretty derogatory terms. I will say for disclosure, I'm technically a millennial 
but I'm at like the very outside range of it, like the very beginning of where it hits. So I don't really consider myself to be a millennial because there are a lot of different mindsets of generations, in my opinion, within that millennial grouping. So it's very different. Plus, the, the whole, like, giving a name to generations is dumb. I think it encourages even more uh, a stratification of society, which is what you end up seeing with the whole millennial versus boomer thing is, like, the older generations are mad at the younger generations. <coughs> excuse me. Then the younger generations matter at the older generations. It's just, it encourages that, and it's dumb. Anyway, uh, I love the reference that they come up with in this to the film Martyrs. I think that's a crazy good film. It's very, very intense. It's very brutal. Uh, Pascal Laguier did it because, I mean, his stuff is insane. I did a review of his other film, uh, Incident in a Ghost Land. I have a review on the channel, so you can check that one out. That one is also very brutal. Not as much so as Martyrs, but his films you just need a palate cleanser after. But people don't really reference this movie, especially not in other movies. So I thought it was very interesting that they reference it in this film. And it's very brutal. It's, it's like an extreme horror film. Uh, the killing scene of Josh Hutcherson's character I thought was pretty funny. I forget what his, <coughs> I forget what his name was in it, like Craig or Neil or I don't know. I forgot because he wasn't in it like super long. The whole thing where she's like trying to get Brianna... Oh, that's the actual person's name. Sadie is trying to stab him the right way, and then Michaela's just like, you're hitting bone, you're not doing it right. Just like the the play between the two of them at that point was really funny. I just like that dialogue. The There was a swipe at, I'm going to talk a little bit like about some of the instances of this kind of like generational, the point of the generational gap, and a lot of it having to do with technology and social media. Uh, there was a real, <coughs> excuse me, there was a real swipe at physical books, uh, when Sadie and Michaela kind of said that, like, physical books are for old people, basically. And, you know, you know, e-books are a thing now. I like, you know, tactile stuff. I like to physically read books, so I guess I'm not, not so much in the millennial realm on that one. But uh, I just thought it was a very... It was the first reference to a generational gap, and there's a bunch of them that go on through this film, and I think it was a very specific pointed one that I think is kind of true for the most part, that the older generations like physically holding things like magazines and books to read them, and the younger generations have been brought up with, you know, just reading things online and, and things not being physically there and being more impermanent, just like I'm going to read this and then it's gone, as opposed to I'm going to go buy this book, read it, and then I'm, I own it, I keep it. So I think that's a big generational difference that they point out. There's another generational moment when Michaela has no idea who Dario Argento is. Jordan makes a reference about saying, like, you know, tell him Sadie was over at my house watching a Dario Argento film. And then Michaela's like, who? DiGiorno? And she, like, he, he consistently can't get the name right. And it kind of makes a really good point that as you go on in time, a lot of these movies can kind of get lost because the newer generations are mainly just going to watch the films that are newer. They're not going to do more of a deep dive and I was like that when I was younger I was very much like I only want to watch <clears throat> excuse me newer films I don't want to watch old films because my assumption is because they're older they're not as good because technology wasn't as good and filmmaking wasn't as good but that's just not true and eventually I got to that point as people can tell from my channel because I have a lot of older film reviews um, I just got to a point where I wanted to deep dive and I think it's important to do that because then you understand <clears throat> excuse me, you understand the evolution, especially of a genre like horror, where, you know, you can see where it started and where it is now and all the changes in between and who influenced who and all that stuff. So it's a very interesting point. It's a, it's a small portion of the film, but it's an interesting point of how, how the younger generations are kind of losing sight of these people like Argento, probably Romero, Carpenter even, you know, it's, it's interesting. Vincent Price, that's another one. I love Vincent Price. The fact that the sheriff won't look at any online online uh, social media highlights the, the boomer versus millennial thing even more. Uh, and it really does speak to a lot of the times older generations tend to dismiss um, online tech and social media in particular. You know, my grandmother, before she passed away, refused, straight up refused to use the internet. 
to get on a computer and use an inter, uh, use the internet. She, and I mean, she only passed away a few years ago now, so the internet had been a thing for quite some time. I mean, my grandfather, before he passed away, he was into comp uh, trying to get into computers and the internet. His knowledge was pretty limited, but he was trying. But, you know, you just get those people, like new tech comes up and they're just like, I'm comfortable with what I have currently, I, I'm not even going to look into this realm because, I mean, it becomes a lot. And especially as you get older and your brain isn't as great and you're not, a, you don't have as much room basically for new knowledge. Uh, you're just kind of like, I feel like oversaturated at this point. I'm not going to learn this newer tech or social media or whatever. So, but that's, that's highlighted very well in this film. It consistently shows, especially with the sheriff, the difference between like, he could be using it as a tool to figure things out. But he just refuses because he's just like, ah, social media, ah, the internet. So the janitor coming in to the like auto, um, auto shop when Michaela and Sadie were in there cutting up the girl's body and he doesn't see them. He like empties the trash. He has his head down the whole time, like empties the trash and turns around and leaves and turns the light off. That was really funny. Maybe one of my favorite parts of the film. I thought it was a good comedic moment. And there are good comedic moments in this. It's not like crazy funny. It's not like a scary movie or scary movie two or anything like that, which those are the best of the scary movies, but it, uh, it has enough comedy that it's good. I like it. They balanced it pretty well. Always good to see Craig Robinson in anything. I love him. He is hilarious and he's funny in this. He's one of the funniest parts of this. Uh, his death scene was actually the best death scene in my opinion. It was very good. Uh, the part where, you know, where he, um, he gets stabbed and then he falls back on the bench press and then it just comes down and just takes the top of his head off. It looked gross and gnarly. And that leads me to the practical effects in this were pretty good, pretty well done. And it, it had a good amount of gore to it. I love the point the sheriff makes that the girls should stop checking in on social media if they don't want the, the, um, Rosedale Ripper to know where she, where they are. And then their response is never, I would rather die. And that kind of highlights how <clears throat> we need millennials and boomers to kind of have more of an open conversation because older generations have certain knowledge about, you know, privacy and just life experiences and the younger generations don't have as many life experiences but they know more about the technology so if they would come together and kind of figure it out they could get to this happy medium of not putting too much of your information out there and not checking in too much and, and so everyone knows where you are at all at all times and actually learning to use it properly so I just I guess I just view it and I think this does a good job the film does a good job of viewing it as Millennials and boomers stereotypically are at total opposite ends of the spectrum. And it would just be really good if they just met in the middle, especially on technology. Political views as well, probably. But um, I have to point out that Jordan would have heard the knife fall on the floor when Sadie goes to kill Jordan and she's sitting on his bed in his bedroom and the knife falls out onto the floor, he would have heard that. It was silent in that room. Uh, they weren't really talking loudly. <clears throat> Excuse me. They weren't really talking loudly when it, when it happened. He would have definitely heard that. It was a thud. So that's kind of an issue. It's small, but that's an issue that I see with the film. Uh, you, you really know that there's, there's going to end up being a rift between Sadie and Michaela at some point. Because they made a very big point of the moment where the um, Rosedale Ripper is trying to talk to Michaela and kind of make her feel like she's not being appreciated by Sadie. And you, at that moment, you recognize it as he's trying to play like psychological games and get them to be at each other's throats so that maybe one of one of them, hopefully Michaela, will let him go. But um, they made so much of a deal of it, it that when I saw that, I was like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that this is eventually leading to them having a big rift between them and that does happen and I think that was good because the way things played out it kind of needed to happen because then it makes it feel even more important and impactful when they actually come back together at the end which I didn't know if that was going to happen or not they <laughs> I thought <coughs> excuse me I thought potentially Sadie was actually gonna um stay the good kid you know like go away from her sociopathic psychopathic tendencies but she didn't. It's all about her, her friendship in the end. 
So speaking of that, in the end, the portion on the stage, I don't know if anyone else felt this way, but it felt a lot like the ending of Scream 2. Did anyone else feel like that? Put some comments down there. Um, I could be totally wrong, but to me, it just felt like the end of Scream 2. That was weird. Uh, based on everything that Jordan heard while he was hiding behind the set piece on that stage, I'm not sure he would have taken action because he was able to sneak in there without being seen. I would have thought that he probably would have just snuck out. I mean, I understand they were relying on him kind of having this this love for Sadie and wanting to save her, but I just don't know how realistic that is because he's hearing that she was involved in that stuff. And he also knows that the Rosedale Ripper is there and Michaela is there and she is also crazy and potentially Sadie is crazy. So he knows the odds are crappy. So I just don't think he would have taken that action. But whatever. I would be interested in a sequel to this one. Them going to college is a natural setup for a sequel saying, okay, here's all the mayhem they could they could cause in high school. <clears throat> what about college? Well, let's see that one. And I'm down. I'm, I'm totally interested. I thought this was a fun film. I thought it was an interesting film. And let me talk about some of the technical aspects. There were audio problems with this film, though. The music is way, way louder than the dialogue. And that's a problem. I hate that. If I have to continually go up and down on the volume with a film, that pisses me off. So they had a real big problem with audio. I hate when they do that. They needed to take more time with it and fix that issue. Not cool. Uh, the music... <coughs> excuse me. But speaking of the music... The music is actually used very well in this. I think it matches the scenes really well, and it does a really good job of keeping that kind of upbeat, poppy, light and airy type feel to it, which you kind of need in that high school setting and with the personalities of Sadie and Michaela and trying to keep it a horror comedy. That stuff is very important. The music is super important for that, and I think they did a really good job with it. Directing and cinematography is really good, too. I think that also matches that kind of, like, upbeat, light and airy feel as well. Uh, with a lot of, like, quick, quick like, uh, pans to the side and um, some slow motion in certain areas and along with the music. I just think it, it worked. So this is a highly exaggerated example of how far people will go to promote so, uh, themselves on social media. Obviously, this is crazy hyperbole, but it's it's a situation where they're so driven by uh, wanting to be seen, wanting to do something. And this is kind of that meshing of infamy and fame, which is a really a big point that, you know, the musician Marilyn Manson was trying to make by creating the band and calling it Marilyn, Marilyn Manson. Everyone in the band has a name that is uh, the first name uh, of a... Uh, supermodel and the last name of a serial killer to kind of make that point of when infamy and fame kind of come together and how confused our society can be about that. And it kind of also goes to the whole thing where people will say, well, any press is good press. And we're moving, I feel like we're moving to a point where some of that, that stuff, those lines are being very much blurred, which is not a good thing. <laughs> um, which leads me to my my last point that this kind of made me think of because in the beginning when they're talking about serial killers and everything they're like this you know a spree serial killer is this or you have serial killers like this <coughs> excuse me uh, it reminds me that there's a potential issue with the popularity excuse me potential issue with the popularity of the true crime genre which I will say I'm a fan of the true crime genre I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts. I watch some true crime shows here and there, but what concerns me, and this points it out, is when people have that conversation with you and they say, who's your favorite serial killer? That's a messed up way to put things. Favorite serial killer indicates you like them, indicates you look at them as not scum, which they are all scum. So it... it speaks to what this film has going on of blurring those lines of fame and infamy. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's something I'm always concerned with. I've had conversations with people like that where they want to talk true crime and they're like, oh, who's your favorite serial killer? And I'll be like, eh. I always stop them and I say, I don't have a favorite serial killer because I don't believe in pumping them up and trying to hold them up as a celebrity. I think that's wrong. 
uh, I because uh, they're terrible. But I do have cases and certain serial killers that um, I have more interest in knowing about just because it's an anomaly. I mean, all like people who commit murder are an anomaly, and that's one of the most interesting things to me. Um, I also really like the new, um, well, it is potentially a problem. I like the new, uh, what am I looking for? Fad of like podcasts and shows going for justice, trying to solve cold cases. That's a great civil service that these are doing. I mean, I know they're making money doing it and they're getting great, <clears throat> great ratings and ad revenue out of it, but it's a good cause. They're doing a great thing. So, but anyway, those are just, you know, my thoughts. I know people will feel very differently about things, but you know, you can put some comments down there. We'll talk about it. So star rating for this out of five stars with half stars in play. It's good. It's not great. It's not the best film. I think it's fun though. Like I enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. And I would definitely recommend people see it at least once. I'm, uh, I'm going to give it three and a half stars. I think it was pretty solid. I think it was well done. And like I said, it makes me want to go check out patchwork now which someone had recommended to me actually recently. I'll have to remember who that was. But anyway, awesome. Thank you everyone for checking this review out. Thank you, Christina Arntz, for throwing this one out to me um, because I knew about this film, but I had kind of forgotten about it. It had been in in my uh, Netflix DVD queue, but that queue is like almost 500 movies. So it was kind of lost in there. So I just kicked it up. Uh, but then I found it on Hulu. So thank you, Christina, and for all the support. Uh, but if you want to support, if you're watching this and you are not a subscriber, please pay me back for this or any other review by just hitting that subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you know whenever I'm putting up new stuff. Uh, hit the like if you want to, especially if you're a subscriber and you just want me to know that you're still watching. Hit that thumbs up and put some comments down there. Let's talk horror. Let's talk about Tragedy Girls. Let's talk about all sorts of stuff horror related. I love it. Anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.